I want to say welcome to those of you who are watching uh, our, our service online here. We actually had some technical difficulties with the recording, so uh, what you'll be seeing is only the sermon part, uh, the message part of our service this day. Our scripture reading for today was from Paul's uh, letter we call 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to be starting at the 16th verse. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, we have already begun to see um, recently uh, more protests, more demonstrations, um, and most of those focus around the relationship between um, the black community and, and police, uh, police officers and such as well. And um, I, I'm afraid this sounds, sort of sounds like a repeat from summer's past that we have seen such protests and demonstrations taking place. And the good news is we have the answer. I have the answer to, to solve this problem. And not just the problem of race, the problem of gender, the problem of, of ageism, and all of that. We can solve this problem. And it's not my answer, it's God's answer, of course. And we're going to be taking a look at God's answer. And, and I do want to make it clear, before I begin, that um, I, I'm speaking as a Christian to you who are Christians. I'm not speaking and I'm making, making no value about uh, those who are not Christians and what they're doing and that sort of thing. Um, but I'm speaking as a Christian. What do we do? What can we do? And we can solve this problem. We're going to begin with the 16th verse. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. You see, the first step that we need to take is to see Christ. So I'm going to pick the first, second part of that first. To see Christ in the right way. To not see him any longer in a human point of view. The Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, his name was Saul. He was a great persecutor of the Christian church. He was the one who held the coats for those who stoned Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And uh, Paul, Saul, eventually had a, well, he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and his name was changed to the Apostle Paul. And Paul's writing here saying he used to consider Christ from a human point of view. He, he considered Christ as just a messianic pretender. A human being pretending to be Messiah. He says, but I no longer consider Christ from that way. Now, I see Jesus is the Messiah. Now Jesus is the Son of God. Now Jesus is the hope for the entire world. And if we're going to solve this problem, first we need to see that that is the truth about Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah, God's own Son, the hope for the world. So we need to see Christ no longer from a human point of view, but as he really is. That brings us to our next point, which I really want to spend a little more time on. 
And, and that is the fact that, uh, as, as Paul writes in the 16th verse from now on, therefore we regard no one from a human point of view. We don't regard Christ that way. We regard no one from a human point of view. We see them differently. Now the 17th verse, that's one of, this is one of our favorite verses, the 17th verse. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And we like that verse because it reminds us that, you know, even when we mess up and make these mistakes, we can start over again in Christ, and that's very true. But I want to remind us of the context that that verse is put into. Verse 16 is all about our relationship with Christ and our relationship with others. Verses 18 and 19 are also about our relationship with others. Sandwich in between is this new creation verse. So certainly what Paul is alluding to is we can have new creation in our relationships with Christ and with others. They can become new. They can become new. So we no longer regard anyone from a human point of view. So if we don't regard them from a human point of view, how do we regard them? Well, from God's point of view, we see them as God sees them. And how does God see them? Well, they're beloved to Him. He loves them. They're made in His image, made in the image of God. That's how God sees them. And, and I want to take a look at four areas in which we need to see people as God sees them, not as most of the uh, people of this world see them. And each of these areas is going to have a scripture related to it, um, just to show you that it does indeed come from scripture. The first area is that of, is that of ethnicity or race. You know, in John chapter 4, you hear the story of Jesus is traveling. He's traveling either to Jerusalem or from Jerusalem, I forget, but he's traveling and he has to go through Samaria. Now, Samaria, you have to understand this. Samaria, the Samaritans, were only part Jews because they had intermarried. The Jews, who were the pure Jews, looked down on the Samaritans because they were pure Jews. They had intermarried with Canaanites and others in the region. And so they were looked at down upon there. Jesus comes to a well to get some water. And he meets a Samaritan woman there. And listen to what she says. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And then it says, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. You see, she was seeing Jesus from a human point of view. See, she slapped this label on Jesus. Okay, he's a Jew. And everything that that means, he can't talk to me, he can't do all these things. But listen to how Jesus responds to her. Jesus doesn't see her from a human point of view. In fact, Jesus says this, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. A spiritual gift of living water. In fact, Jesus offers her this gift. And the great news is she takes it. She takes this gift of living water. See, Jesus didn't see her as a Samaritan. He saw deeper. He saw her as a person of value. And not only did she take the gift, half the village she brought to Jesus, so they could share that gift as well. We no longer see by ethnicity. Secondly, I want to say we no longer see gender. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 3, verse 28, he writes, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male or female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not saying we can't tell who men and women are now. I mean, we can see there's a difference. But I think what Paul's saying is in the church, right, in a 
if somebody comes to this church, if a woman comes to this church, wants to be in this church, and wants to be a part and do things in the church, we don't tell them, okay, we have a place for you, you're here with the other women, you go, you cook, you bake, you clean, whatever. We don't see that. The same with if a man comes in, we don't say, okay, you have to do these certain things because you're a man. We look and we see the gifts, the graces that they have. And we say, this is where you can help based on your gifts and your graces. Because there's no longer male or female. We don't see ethnicity, we don't see gender, we don't see age. Is the third one. Paul's writing to his protege, Timothy, who's young. He's a church leader, but he's a young church leader. And so Paul writes in this first, this what we call First Timothy. And he writes to Timothy, Let no one despise your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith. In purity. Right? You're young, Timothy, and people might want to put you down for that. But that doesn't matter. It's not how young you are, it's whether or not you're mature in the faith or not mature in the faith. That's the difference. Don't let people put you down. In fact, he goes on and he says, Do not speak harshly to an older man. So it goes the other way, too. We don't put people down because they're old. That's what our society wants to do, I think, but we don't do that. Do not speak harshly to an older man, but speak to him as a father, to younger men as, we might think he's going to say sons, but he doesn't. Speak to younger men as brothers. Then he says to older women as mothers, to younger women as sisters. We don't see the age, we see the maturity in Christ. And we don't see the age as well. The last area I want to speak about is, and for this we have to go all the way back to the Old Testament, and, and that is that um, we don't see, judge people according to appearance, what they look like. We live in a society that's enamored by appearance. On most of the magazine covers, you know, the, the people, the good looking people, right, are, are put on those magazines and those sorts of things. But the prophet Samuel had to be reminded of this. You see, Saul, now I'm not talking about the Apostle Paul before he became the Apostle Paul, that's Saul. I'm talking in the Old Testament, Saul was the first king of Israel, a different Saul. Saul had failed. He had failed and Samuel was told by God to go find another king. But all Samuel knew is it would be one of the sons of Jesse. So he goes to Jesse's house, and uh, he has Jesse bring his sons before him. The first one is tall, strapping, good-looking Eliab. And this is what uh, the scripture says. When they came, the sons came, Samuel looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. He looked into the appearance. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord sees beyond, beyond the appearance. And we need to see beyond the appearance as well. So I think a very important question for us is simply this. And I think we all do this, but we really need to honestly ask ourselves, do I see people according to their ethnicity, their gender, their age, their appearance? Or do I see people as people? Apart from all that, apart from all the labels we put on people. So this brings us to the last couple of verses. I um, look at verse 16 talked about we no longer regard anyone from a human point of view. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, we are a new creation. 
Now let me read to you verses 18 and 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. In other words, we're called to bring people together. That's our calling. And we can only do that when we no longer regard people from a human point of view. We can begin to bring people together. Now, I want to talk for just a couple minutes about Black Lives Matter, but I want you to understand as well, when I say Black Lives Matter, I'm not talking about the organization. Believe me, there's things there I don't agree with. I'm talking about the slogan, the simply the slogan, Black Lives Matter. And I'm sure if I asked you, do black lives matter? We'd all agree, I think, that black lives do matter. But the rejoinder would come back and would say, well, but the truth is all lives matter. And if I were to say, do all lives matter? I think we'd all agree. All lives matter. Now, I once heard an explanation of why we need to say black lives matter. Uh, I'm not sure how much I agree with this, I'm still pondering this, but it's the best explanation at least I've heard. And here is the explanation. A young activist I saw said, all lives do matter, but right now we have to focus on black lives because that's where the problems are, that's where the oppression is. Again, maybe, maybe not, I'm not exactly sure about that, but my point is simply to say this. As Christians, that should apply to us. Because already we're seeing beyond race. Already we're seeing the person. Because we don't regard people from a human point of view. Martin Luther King Jr. gave, in August of 1963, gave one of his best known speeches. It was his I Have a Dream speech on the Mall in Washington, D.C. And he he said something in there that's very interesting. I think he said something that many, many of us have forgotten. Let me read this, just one line of, his, of that speech to you. Martin Luther King Jr. in the Mall of Washington. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Boy, doesn't that sound like 2 Corinthians chapter 5? It almost sounds like Martin Luther King Jr. was a pastor. Which, of course, if you know, he was a pastor. You know, maybe that's what he was thinking about when he wrote that. One of the problems we have is everybody's still judging people by the color of their skin and not the content of their character. But us as Christians, we know we know better. And we can make a difference. I know we can make a difference. So let me give you a story. Um, the story takes place in Durham, North Carolina in 1971. At that time, the schools of Durham were still segregated. Whites in their schools, blacks in their schools as well. Um, there was a fire in the elementary black school, which led to a discussion about integration. And um, the school board was trying to decide what to do, and they decided to form a committee. They actually brought in a mediator, and the mediator uh, formed, a, put a group together um, to discuss the issue. The group would have equal representation, blacks and whites, those who are for, those who are against, and they would spend time, their time discussing this issue one with another. And what was probably a stroke of brilliance, the mediator put as the leaders of these two groups, the black group of this group, the leader was Ann Atwater, who was an outspoken white, or I'm sorry, an outspoken black woman, very much for integration and uh, for black issues. The leader of the white group was the local head of the Ku Klux Klan. 
You can imagine how they got together. When they got together to this group, they fought, right? It did not go well, but they were forced to get together. They were forced to go through this process. And at one point, they're talking at water in Ellis, and Anne holds up her Bible. And she says, this here does my talking for me. And Ellis says to her, I have a Bible. And she says, then you ought to know. He says, know what? And she says, say God made you, made me. So this process goes on for a little while. Um, then it's finally time, and at the end they're going to take a vote. Each side is going to take a vote and see where they stood. And the school board of Durham said that they would honor that vote. So one by one, at least how they portrayed it in the movie, you know, uh, black got up and said they wanted to vote for integration, and white got up and said they wanted to vote for segregation, and it went back and forth. Finally, Ann Atwater got up. She spoke passionately for integration, and um, she voted for that. Then C.P. Ellis got up. And he stood up there and he pulled out his Ku Klux Klan card, his membership card. And he talked about how important that card was to him. It was his life. They were his family. So important. And then he took it and he tore it up. Because he said it's not so important anymore. And he voted for integration. See, it's possible. Right? With God, all things are possible. With God, he can bring even the most unlikely people together. That is our call. That is our ministry. So we have this ministry of reconciliation, bringing people together. But we have another calling, too. And this is important as well. Reconciling people to Christ. Bringing people to Jesus Christ. And the more we do that, the more deeper the people who are already Christians grow in their faith, give their lives to Jesus Christ, that will change the world. That will bring the world together. That's the true answer that we're talking about here. So I urge you to participate in this ministry of reconciliation and also this ministry of helping others come to Christ. This truly is our calling, such an important calling it is. Father God, we say thank you just for the calling that you have given to us. Help us not in our power, but in your power. Have this ministry of reconciliation to bring people together, people who you never think possible, but when we no longer recognize people from a human point of view, we can bring them together through Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. Amen. God bless you all.